Well, that was just to give you a flavour of where we came from. Clive is now going to deal with the bit that you're really interested in, which is how did we start to specialise in trying to catch the big ones? Okay. Um, so, why live baiting? Well, what we'd learned um, up to the point where we started to specialise a little bit was that the, the strip baits, the fish strip baits, were, were giving us fish typically sort of two to four pounds. And um, to catch bigger fish, we knew that we would need to use things like mackerel heads. Mackerel heads caught us a reasonable number of decent bass over the inshore reefs that Kim was describing. But if you try to use those on more sporting gear and on nylon traces, conger and tope turned up and bit you off. It, it, we couldn't specifically target bass. We had to accept bass as a, as a bycatch when we were um, fishing for conger and tope. Um, John Darlin, and Kim's got his book on bass fishing, which I'm, most of the people in this room I'm sure are familiar with. But before John wrote that book, which has got some fantastic information in it, uh, he wrote an article in Angling Times millions of years ago. And it was an article that I read and I did not believe. And John Darlin said that he could f drift a wreck and he could drift a very specific part of a wreck and catch bass on that specific part. And if he was 10 yards either side of it, he wouldn't catch bass. That's where he needed to be. Now, the electronics of the day didn't really lend themselves to what John was talking about. Um, so I didn't believe it. And that thought stayed in my brain for a very long time. But at the time, I can remember reading it and thinking, no, that's nonsense. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about how what he cracked, we cracked many years later. Um, the flat battery story. So I was um, living in Brighton. I was driving home on a cold winter's night in a crappy old Vauxhall Beaver, going up a hill, and the damn thing conked out, and I had to ca call out the AA man. And it was so cold that the AA man, he came along and had a look at it, tested my battery, battery was crap. He said, I've got a replacement in the van. Do you want to buy one? I said, yes. He said, well, it's freezing cold out here. Go and sit in my cab. So I went in this AA man's cab. Now, this was um, 1998. And he had a little Garmin unit, um, a little navigator. And I thought, crikey, the old AA are getting sophisticated. I've only ever seen these on boats. And he's got one in his cab. And I was looking around to try and work out how he wired it into his cab. So when he came to settle up the bill, I said, oh, I noticed the Garmin. I said, I'm quite impressed that you're using these for you know, coming on call outs. And he said, no, that's from a boat. I've just gone down to the boat and taken it off. And you know what fishermen are like when we get together. Three quarters of an hour later, um, this poor bloke feels like he's been with the Spanish Inquisition <laughs> because he's got so much information about live, you know, we eventually got onto bass. He, he understood which patch I was fishing. Um, he was fishing off New Haven um, and he was saying to me, go live baiting for bass. Um, now, he, he wasn't a saint. This was a bloke who used trebles and he killed his bass and he used the money to subsidise his moorings. So he wasn't going to be my next best friend, but he told me an awful lot about the enthusiasm that he had for how successful this technique was. And he said it works on reefs as well as wrecks. Well, that piece of information probably took me 15 years to, to properly apply. Um, but we started off um, fishing on the wrecks with the technique. The other thing that we spotted was um, trips down to Weymouth, People who know the Portland race, um, we saw, um, on our trips, we saw the professional bass fishermen. If you ever want to feel really inadequate, get on a charter boat at Weymouth and go and fish alongside the professional bass fishermen. Eight anglers on a boat, we'll get two bass in a drift. Two anglers on a boat, and they'll get a dozen. Those guys know what they're doing. And those guys, in, when we first started fishing down there, they didn't like to fish for bass unless they got live baits. They put lots of time into getting their live baits. And all of these little pieces of information filtered in to our brains. So 
We and half do some things wrong to start with. <laughs> we, um, we try to apply, we, uh, we think about fishing too much. So we are trying to apply some logic to this live baiting thing. Now a live mackerel is, is I mean, they go all over the place. You catch one on a live tackle, they go all over the place. So our first big mistake was, well, you've got to use a big lead. You've got to keep these damn things under control. So we were using 12 ounces of lead, God forbid. So we had to use fairly heavy rods to handle these big leads. So that was nonsense. Treble hooks are amazingly effective at catching you big bass on your live baits. You'll land far more fish if you're using treble hooks compared to circle hooks. But you'll kill an unacceptable number of those bass. If it gets a treble hook all the way down into the gut, it, I mean, that bass isn't just to survive. So we started off on treble hooks and we moved away, and I'll explain that in a bit. Long traces. For some bizarre reason, there was almost folklore that you had to use 12 foot traces when you were live baiting for bass. You know, we read it in magazines left, right, and center in those early days. The worst thing you can possibly do is use a 12 foot trace. Um, what happens when you're fishing for bass is a bass will come and kill a live bait and then come back and take it. If you got a lead which is maybe four, maybe six foot off the bottom on a drift and you got 12 foot of trace and a bass comes and hits it and you've got a treble hook st sticking out of its snout, what happens is that that mackerel falls into the bottom, you've got a treble hook on and it snags up. So we didn't even know we were getting bites because we had such long traces and we were forever snagging up the bottom and couldn't mm. work out why, why these mackerel were swimming into the bottom and we really got it wrong. Um, we didn't use floats in those days, we were only tight lining um, on our fishing and, and floats adds an <coughs> extra dimension. And the early days, Kim was much more successful, we'd, we'd, we were fishing predominantly wrecks and Kim would quite often catch four, five, six bass on these live baits using these techniques, um, but not much over six pounds. Most of them were sort of three to five pounds. So we were on to something, but it just wasn't working quite the way that we were expecting it to work. So some of the refinements, and I've got a bit of gear here, I'm going to get Nigel to play as a bass in a minute as well, if I may. Um, helicopter rigs, apart from the thing, the, um, the damn things. Um, I'm going to be a bugger now. If you hold the hook, yeah. So a helicopter rig, all a helicopter rig is, is a swivel, caught between two swivels, rubber, rubber beads there. Um, down in um, Weymouth, they call it the Portland rig. And it's a great anti-tangle device when you're using live baits. We didn't use that to start with and we were getting tangles, but a Portland rig is a great way of presenting live baits and it allows them to swim around. On this thing, I've got, and I apologize to those at the back because you're not gonna see this properly, but on this thing, I've got a funny trap swivel there, which you buy off the shelf which saves you having to tie up a Portland rig and they work beautifully, they don't tangle at all. So that was another step in the right direction. Float fishing in um, water under about 40 foot deep. What we were doing is, is we'd learnt a technique probably in, or were learning a technique in 50, 60 foot of water. When we tried to apply it to shallower ground, it just wasn't having the same, same um, success and we worked out because we used to use floats for bream fishing and, and getting the float away over the ground, you know that that float's getting the bait away from the scare area of the, of the, um, of the boat. And we use these bloody great big things to suspend our live baits. And that will carry a live mackerel and a three ounce lead. So these sourcing these big floats was a nightmare. It took us ages to actually find a supply of these things. Now, uh, you know, again, we're going back about 15 years when we were starting to refine the technique. Six foot fluorocarbon traces. You don't need any more than, you know, don't, you don't need these 12, 15 foot traces. Six foot is ample. 
Um, lighter leads. We, we started to move away from the heavy leads. We predominantly use probably anywhere, if we're not float fishing, we'll use sort of four to six ounce leads, depending on wind and tide conditions. And that means that we can use lighter tackle and get more fun out of it. And then the plotter, I'm going to come on to talk about how we use our plotter and how that's made a huge difference to our, the repeatability of what we're doing. 